we are excited that you are fellowshipping with us tonight in person and through the power of the internet. Amen. If you'll notice, hey, these youth are looking awfully mature and handsome. <laughs> uh, and old. Yeah, there's, the Her. youth are on a, a little older. We'll say mature, experienced, you know. Uh, the youth are on a trip, so we have the privilege tonight of leading worship. Uh, but we are excited just to worship God in his presence. So if you'll stand as we pray and approach the throne of grace. God, we thank you tonight for your spirit in this place. God, we thank you that your word says where two or three are gathered. There you are in the midst. Yes. So God, tonight we thank you for your presence. We welcome you here. God, we just thank you for everything that you've done, for giving us grace, for giving us your mercy and your Holy Spirit. God, we just believe that tonight we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. And we thank you for that through your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chain. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And every knee will bow before him. Oh, 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 oh. So open up the gates way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. Roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? 
Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Aren't you glad that every knee has to bow before him? Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm thankful. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. Well, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Cause I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. This power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Let's sing that with just our voices. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My 
fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, oh, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Father, we thank you tonight that your word says perfect love casts out all fear. God, we thank you tonight that that is the declaration of our heart. We are not slaves to fear because we are children of God. You unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave child of God. Sing it out. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I am surrounded by the arms of the Father. I am surrounded by songs of deliverance. We've been We're the sons and the daughters. Let us sing our freedom. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh,
split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Sing it again. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. Full of faith, yes, I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Yes, Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. sound beautiful tonight. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas great that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life in my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending love. My chains are gone, I've been set free. 
My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending love. Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God, who called me here below, will be. chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing tonight we just worship you God you are so good God you are so amazing you have given us everything we need it pertains to life and godliness it says in your word your word says surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life God we thank you for your spirit living in us we thank you for your grace that renews us and sustains us. And God, we thank you that every step of the way you walk with us. Your word says, never will you leave us, never will you forsake us. So God, we have nothing to fear with you by our side, and we just praise you for that tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Prayer group can go to your appointed place. The rest of us are going to stay here. Just want to remind you of Ron Bowman's memorial ride this Saturday. Meet at 8 o'clock. Register. We're leaving by 9. And uh, you might want to converse with some individuals about who's riding with who. Amen. And now Pastor Luke to teach. Well, that was a blessing to me. That was fun. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to go with the spirit, right? It's like, hey, we got half a dozen people in the house. Let's sing a cappella. <laughs> but again, it's not always about the numbers, right? It's about people who are faithful. And uh, that fits perfectly with what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to begin the book of 2 Timothy. Starting in chapter 1, I'm going to give a little background and context too, but this is kind of like the final leg of our, of our journey here on our study about discipleship. We talked a lot about what it means to be a person of integrity. 
not just being somebody who has character, although that's extremely important, but being the same person that you are everywhere you are. That there's no masks you wear, there's no anything you gotta worry about because you are who you are when you're alone by the grace of God and you are who you are in public by the grace of God. I even think about that. There's a good verse that Paul, he's having to defend his apostleship um, because there's all the other people. Oh, well, Paul, you know, he's just okay, but we're the super apostles. We got everything. We could figure it out. We're the best. We're the smartest. And some people are saying, you know what? Paul wasn't really, can you hear me? Paul was not really an apostle, they say. You know what Paul said? He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. <laughs> so I love that. So, 2 Timothy is Paul's third, well, technically second pastoral letter. We did Titus, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Um, and I just want to review a little bit about Paul's journey because 2 Timothy is actually the last letter he had wrote, right? So a little background, he's in Rome awaiting execution, and he's been in prison before. You know, just like that old song, I'm no stranger to prison. Paul was not. This time he was in prison, and he's like, I'm not getting out. <laughs> I know what's at the end of this course. And so he gets to the opportunity to write one final letter. And what I love about this is this wasn't to the church. You know, it'd be like, okay, Paul, you should write the big impactful letter to everybody here. He writes it to one person, his faithful disciple, Timothy. Because <laughs> like Paul realized... If we're trying to grow the church, right, we're trying to grow as disciples, it's not just about big numbers. It's not just about drawing crowds, right? Jesus, at the end of his ministry, <laughs> he whittled that crowds of thousands into 70, into 12, and then there's three of them in the garden. And he's like, come on, you guys, just the three of you, you can't even stay awake, <laughs> right? It's when you get down to the, to the very crux of things, the very final point, you see who's really with you. And I love that Timothy's that guy. It's his protege. He's poured in and invested everything into this guy. So he gets one last letter. It's like, here's my final thoughts. But here's a little bit of Paul's journey, right? We find him. He's holding the coats of the people who are stoning the small Christian church. He's holding the coats of the people that are stoning Stephen. He gets met on the road of Damascus by God himself. And God says, why are you picking on me? Why are you persecuting me, Paul? I got something I want you to do. We find him in the Arabian desert for a few years, learning and being taught by the Holy Spirit. He's forced to flee to Damascus. He's hidden away in a basket, spends 10 years in Tarsus. And his friend Barnabas brings him over to Antioch. He goes on missionary journeys, the Council of Jerusalem. He picks up friends like Timothy. He loses friends along the way. He's arrested in Judea in 58 AD. He's imprisoned in Caesarea for two years, which he uses as an opportunity to appeal to Caesar and go before Caesar and preach and witness of the gospel. On his way there, he's shipwrecked. He spends a couple months on an island he gets shipwrecked on. Then he's under house arrest in Rome, in prison. He writes some prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, then he's acquitted and released, so he writes his letters, 1 Timothy and Titus, that we've written while he's in Macedonia. Again, as soon as he's out of prison, boom, he's back to work, preaching the gospel. Then he's arrested again. And like I said, this is kind of the final, final time, so he takes time to pen this letter to Timothy. In, and this would be in 67 AD. He's arrested. He's in chains. He's treated as a criminal, which we'll, we'll see as he writes this. And even though he's going through tough times. He knows the end is near. He's pretty much deserted by everybody. He takes that opportunity to forgive all the people who wronged him. <laughs> right? He's like, I'm not taking any of that stuff with me. I'm not taking any anger and hate with me. He even says in the letter, may it not be counted against them, all the people who are cowardly and ran away and left him <laughs> as soon as things got hard. So in this epistle, we're going to read, there's one word Paul emphasizes a lot. And if you're a, a note taker, this is a good one to write down. It's loyalty. That's why I picked some of the songs we sang tonight. It's about loyalty. Why? Because Paul sees like, okay, it's the end of the road. Who's still with me? Right? But what I love is this isn't just like a sorry, like, oh, man, I'm going through hard stuff kind of letter. 
Paul is looking for those characteristics in other people because that's what he's finding in himself. As we went through the journey, he's been in and out of prison, in and out of different cities preaching the gospel. He's been wronged. He's met friends. He's lost friends. And the most important thing to him was being loyal to Jesus Christ. That same guy that met him on the road to Damascus, he knew he was going to meet him again. And the one thing he wanted, he's like, I want to be loyal. I want to be faithful to what God called me to do. Amen. Oh, that just sits right here. Just doesn't it hit you deep? At the end of his life, he's thinking, man, I want to be found faithful in God. All of it was good up until this point, and guess what? I'm going to finish with excellence. And in the whole tone of it, like I said, it's not like a weeping, like, oh, I'm going through all this bad stuff. As a matter of fact, he spends half the letter encouraging Timothy. Timothy's pastoring a really, like, the biggest megachurch out there in Ephesus, right? Poor Timothy. And Paul's like, don't worry, Timothy. It's going to be great, <laughs> you know? I mean, Timothy had to read this like, what? Is he serious? But the whole tone of this letter is about triumph. Paul knows he's going to lose his head in a little while, but he knows that when he crosses over into eternity, he's going to receive a crown of glory. That just, oh, I love that. So he spends all his time encouraging Timothy, and he talks about loyalty. He addresses Timothy not as pastor of the megachurch. No, he doesn't say pastor of the church of Ephesus, got it going on, overcame his fears, overcame all the doubters and haters in his church. No, he says, you are my son in the faith. He says that in 2 Timothy 2. This is a personal letter he's writing. This letter contains 25 references to specific individuals. Um, remember, we're in the same place we talked about, Barabbas, that we're in the place of the Son of God, that we get all the, the blessings and the glory, and Jesus had to suffer all the punishment. Well, Paul's going through some of that suffering, but he still knows exactly what God has for him. So 1 Timothy was all about faith in the church, having good doctrine, having order, having officers in the church, because there was going to be an apostasy or a falling away coming. Um, and he addresses duties of the officers. So it's very like putting order and structure, discipline in the church so that the church would go on, right? It's not just about having good systems, right? Any person who runs in a business or operates a business knows you have to have good systems. But systems are for managing things. What keeps everything going is good people. And you see when Paul is closing up his thoughts here, he's talking all about people. So in 2 Timothy, just an outline of the book, the first chapter is about the afflictions of the church. The second chapter is the activity of the church. And the third and fourth chapters are about the allegiance of the church. Paul's passions for the church. As we go through the New Testament, we find there's a couple different metaphors for the church. In 1 Peter, it's addressed as the holy nation. Revelation 5, we're called the kingdom. In 1 Peter 2, we're the priesthood. Jesus talks about the church as the vine in John 15. Paul calls us the temple in Ephesians 2. In Corinthians, we're, the, we're a body. Hebrews, we're a called out assembly. 1 Peter 5, the church is a flock. But when he's talking to Timothy, we're a family. That's how he addresses the church. So he, he's, he's caring so much about the church because he knows that there's an apostasy coming. Um, there's something called the, the departure, right? It's kind of interesting that um, in Luke 18, Jesus is talking about kind of the end of times, and he's just about approaching prophetic language. Jesus takes the time, and he's talking to his disciples, and they're the foundation of the church. He said, Men always ought to pray and not faint. And then he starts, he gives the analogy of what persistence looks like, and he talks about a woman. Right? So he's lecturing men. Men always not to pray and not faint. Here's a, the persistence of a woman, right? That she badgers a judge and gets what she wants, and he says, hey, how much more good is God, right? You don't have to be like a nagging person to get what you want. You ask and you receive, right? Yes, sir. So he gives this you know, beautiful thing about prayer and endurance. And then Jesus, it, it ends in Luke 18. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith? 
It's like, wow, when you read some of that stuff, you know, Jesus knew what his mission was all about. And he, as he's getting to the close of it, too, he's talking about when we get to the end, are people going to remain faithful? Right? Are people still going to believe in the end of times when there's, you know, oh, we're so smart now, we have all this science, you know, even though common sense is not <laughs> as widespread as it used to be. I wish that would spread like a like pandemic, right? <laughs> some common sense and some wisdom. <laughs> I better be careful. I'm done. I'm dropping that. I'm just just saying. But um, he knew that there was a falling away that was coming. He, he calls it in 1 Thessalonians that there's a, the word in Greek is harpazo or a rapture. But he also talks about that departure. But then there's also people who leave the faith. So that's why we've invested so much time talking about how important sound doctrine is. Because Paul laid that foundation because you have to know the word of God when the tempter and the liar comes around. We talked last week, like he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeing who can who he can devour. So Paul's exactly right as he's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy that the same stuff's going to come around. There's apostasy on the horizon. So this is his last letter. What's he begin as he addresses Timothy? So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Jesus Christ Jesus. <laughs> so I was thinking, why would he put that? You know, why is he writing that? I, I'm guessing he had to wonder, you know, he's about to be beheaded, and he's like, is this really God's will? Like, <laughs> is this how things are going to end? But here's what I love about Paul, how Paul thinks about everything. Paul's not going to just pout and have a pity party and be like, well, is this really the will of God? He's like, you want to talk about the will of God, devil, as you're out there whispering? I remember I was riding a road to Damascus. <laughs> and by the supernatural disruption of the Holy Spirit, by the will of God, I was called to this life. Don't you just love that? He's like, he reminds the devil and maybe reminds himself a little bit. You want to talk about the will of God? I know what the will of God is. It was according to the promise of life. Remember, he knows his head's going to get cut off. He's like, oh, thank God for the promise of life in Jesus Christ. So there's always referred to, there's four wills of God. So for the will of God, the first one is his sovereign will. So this is sometimes referred to as the mystery of his will. That's like he makes things go, right? Planets spin in their order and everything. There's his revealed will, which he shows us through the word of God. And then there's his will for mankind, which is salvation. And his will for the believer, which is sanctification. So that's living a holy life, right? So I love that. All the problems staring him in the face, he just goes straight against it. Like, I know what the will of God is. I know it's life. And he addresses Timothy in verse 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. He refers to him as a spiritual son. And it's interesting that Paul adds the word mercy to his greeting. Typically when he wrote pastors, he, you know, he had the grace and peace. And, but he adds mercy in this section. At the, at the there's a note that says, Paul, Paul realized that pastors has earned the need for some mercy, right? So I thought that was good. So then he continues on in the next couple of verses about in his prayers. So he says, I thank God, which again, that's the, that's the proper disposition under suffering and when all the bad stuff. He says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing... I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day. So Paul was praying this, not just in routine, but with passion and a real concern for his son Timothy. Right? And again, it's like, he's got a lot going on. <laughs> you think he'd be like, God, help me do what I got to do. And, you know, I only have so much time left, God. And he's like, oh, well, please be with Timothy. Like, that's his focus. Paul had his priorities in order. He knew what his legacy was. So the question for us is, what's our prayer list, right? The Chuck Missler notes, is your pastor on it? He says, how about your elected representatives? And then how serious and passionate are we about prayer? That's the challenge for us to consider. He continues in verse 4, Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy 
when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. So he's like, you're crying. He's like, I'm rejoicing. Why? Because you're my disciple and you're walking in faith. And he doesn't take credit for it. He's like, hey, your grandma and your ma prayed you in the kingdom. <laughs> and I appreciate that, right? That's, that's my story. My mom's the reason I'm here. And some people say, oh, you know the Bible so well. And it's like, well, that's, again, that's all credit to my mom. Every night we read Bible stories <laughs> from little on. We prayed together, and, you know, she's going to get a big blessing in the kingdom of God just for sticking with me. You know, I always joke, if I go live and play music on Facebook, I can count that she's right there. Like, I am blessed and highly favored. So he's, Paul's talking about the same thing to Timothy, about the blessing of the legacy of faith that has run in his family. And that, that's a real blessing for him. He's saying, hey, I know that what the work I've done is going to live on, not just in the, you know, oh, wow, Paul wrote all these cool letters and Paul did all these big travels. He's like, no, that people and my spiritual sons are going to continue on in the faith. Um, and it's interesting, in the Old Testament, there's this section where it talks about that, um, you know, that there was a school of the prophets, right? That there was this, legacy of faith and spiritual development in the prophetic realm that they would teach young prophets how to be a prophet. Um, later on, we see that Eli is supposed to be the head priest, right? He's supposed to carry on the legacy, um, passing on all those good things to the next generation. But that stops with him because his sons were wicked, right? So often we think like doing ministry in the kingdom Having an impact for God means, oh, we have to do all these things. We have to international ministry, all that stuff. Ministry back then would have continued and been a blessing if Eli would have raised up good godly kids. Right? We can't get so focused on doing all this external stuff that we're not taking care of our spiritual family at home. And again, I'm not, that's no condemnation if you got family away from the Lord. I know you're praying for them. But again, that's the priority is like what's really going to remain is how we handle our family and investing and pouring into those people. You know, sometimes you'll be like, oh, I'm just, a, I'm just a parent, or I'm just this or that. It's like, no, that's the most important thing. <laughs> Wouldn't we all wish, like, we all had two perfect parents, right? I know every teacher, if you're a teacher watching this, is like, I wish we had really good godly parents engaged with every kid. <laughs> if you don't believe me, ask a teacher. So, again, it's important to develop your spiritual family. He continues at verse 6, Wherever I put thee in remembrance that you stir up, the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. He says, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I love this. This is uh, Paul's final address to Timothy. And he's saying, like, hey, you've been afraid. He's like, you know, he's like, let's deal with it. I just love the declaration he has. God has not given us a spirit of fear. I think that's a word for us right now, and I'm not... Amen. Even more than just the virus and pandemic and all that stuff. Just there's so much stuff people are afraid to move forward, it seems. I, this is going to sound controversial, and forgive me, just give me grace here. I think the pandemic was an excuse for a lot of people to finally live out what they felt inside. I just feel that by the Spirit. So many people were afraid, and that was an excuse to finally like externalize it and build it up and make it real. You know, there's a lot of people who say, like, oh, I can't talk to other people. I'm an introvert. And it's like, well, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, I can't go and I can't be friendly to people, and, you know, I'm just this way. This is, well, you can find any excuse you want if you're looking for something. You know, if, you wanna, if you're looking for an excuse, you'll find one. Um, I know the, there's a special forces group. They say, find an excuse to win. All right, same thing for us. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And I could say that. I was probably the most fearful person standing in this room. Before God and the Holy Spirit came in my life, I was probably the most fearful person. I could give you story after story, but it's embarrassing, so I'm not going <laughs> to. Of things that I was so fearful of. Fearful of what people thought. Fearful to take a chance. I, you know, I had to sit in my own little cocoon and protect myself from what everyone else thought or just little ideas of things that I built up of what I thought would happen if I actually just stood up and just be the person I'm supposed to be. 
You know, that's when I realize most. When people say, wow, you're confident and you speak. And it's like, well, I'm, it's not just like a confidence. Like, I'm not cocky now. I don't think like, oh, I'm so good at all of this. If I can say anything that God did in my life, is he finally really like, why are you so focused on yourself? You know, God checked me on that. He's like, why are you so worried about what everyone thinks about you? You know, your, your job, and this is for all of us as ministers, right? I say it every week. Who's a full-time minister in the kingdom of God? All of us are. When it comes down to it, it's not about us. Like, we're not trying to win this popularity contest. No one's going to get to the end of our life and be like, wow, he had the most likes on Facebook, or everyone thought they were the best. You know, it's not just about everyone's popular opinion. It's about doing what God called us to do. And Paul got that more than anybody. Right? Paul went through more attacks and, like I said, gained more friends, lost more friends than anybody. And at the end of his life, he goes, hey, it was never about me. This is all about what Jesus Christ has done for me. He's writing these letters, and he's not pumping himself up. He's like, if there was a chief of sinners, that was me. Right? That is me. You know, and that's our attitude we can carry in the gospel. And I love that he marched that all the way through his ministry. He's like, guess what? It's not about me. Yep, I'm about to go on and die, but that's okay. Because it's not about me. The Holy Spirit's going to keep this church going. And we, we get to live in that blessings of what Paul started, right? Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. It's really weird. Where did he go? All around Turkey. Like where Turkey is now. That's where Paul marched around. The seven churches in Revelation, you know, that we read about. There's different dispensations, and we'll get into that later too. People talk about, oh, the seven churches are church ages. And it's cool, and it fits that way. But it was seven local churches in Asia. And Paul built up these churches to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's gone all around the world. And what's crazy now... Paul was trying to disciple these people, and it's interesting that in the area that Paul started the church in his ministry, that area is now completely a different faith. And what's weird is there's a certain religion who has done a fantastic job of discipling that area. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if you think about it, Christian churches, we're not discipling like we should, right? But there's a certain faith in that area that goes in, and they're not worried about stepping on anybody's toes, they say, hey, these are the rules. This is how you should live. This is how husbands ought to act. You ought to be this way. And women, we ought to interact with each other this way. Right? I know that sounds controversial to anybody, but don't, don't you see there's a, some people are discipling out there, and they're doing a terrific job of getting their point across. So for us as Christians, we can't be afraid, like, oh, I can't say nothing to somebody. Oh, what, what people say. It's like, well, some people aren't worried about that, and they're having a lot of success getting people converted. So, I mean, how much more the church of Jesus Christ filled with the Holy Spirit being overcomers can we go out and disciple people and we can go out and evangelize and minister? So I'm all over the place. I'm just <laughs> going for God's sake. I'm not even near the notes. but um, So, yeah, I love that. He, but he, that's Paul's ad admonition. And I, I think he's almost being a little tough. You can see the toughness in here. He's like saying, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. He's given you a spirit of power. It's like, oh, that's for, that means demonstration power, power and authority, that by the Holy Spirit, God's going to show his will and his way. And it's not just mean, it's a spirit of love, too. It says later, perfect love casts out every fear. And you know what? I love it. He says, and it gives us a sound mind. So guess what? In these times when people are saying, I'm losing it, I'm losing my mind, I'm losing my mind staying cramped up in my apartment, and I can't go see this person, right? God's answer to that? We've got a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. That's what he's given us. The word fear is literally, it's like delia, which means timidity, fearfulness. It even means cowardice. Like when you step up at the moment, you just, you cower away, you're a coward. But the answer is sound mind. The word is sophronismos, which is an admonishing or calling to be sound of mind, to moderation and self-control, to be disciplined, not just brashness or being over the top. So I love that. He's like, no, no, you're a soldier. Like, put some concrete in your coffee and toughen up. <laughs> so he continues on in verse 8. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be you a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So remember, a bunch of people left Paul. Timothy's still like, hey, that's my guy. You know, he's my spiritual father. And I'm sure a bunch of people are talking, and Paul's saying, don't worry about that. Don't be ashamed. Just because we're suffering for the gospel, good. That's what we're supposed to do. That's how we advance the gospel. 
So a lot of people talk about the afflictions of the gospel. Um, a lot of people think, okay, now that I'm saved, life ought to be easy. I can pray and God just fixes everything. <laughs> can anybody remember when we used to think like that? Like, oh good, God will just fix stuff right now. <laughs> All of a sudden he's a genie in a bottle for us that whatever we ask he just does and poof. Now life's just a, a stroll through the garden, right? Not quite. We have to remember that suffering is a part of the Christian life. Even Jesus, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke twenty-two forty-two. He's got suffering going on, and he says, Father, if you would be willing, take this cup from me. Even Jesus was like, hey, if there's another way to, to get through this, that'd be great. But you know what? If not, I'm going to go through it. So Jesus, that's the same spirit of Jesus living out in Paul. In John 15, it says, the world's going to hate you. You know that it hated me before it hated you. That's what Jesus said. So again, it's not a popularity contest. So, um, continues on in verse 9. Oh, there's a quote by Samuel Rutherford. He said, If you were not strangers here, the hounds of the world would not bark at you. So I thought that was good. Getting criticism from ungodly people. He says in verse 9, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So I love that. He, he, he gets down to the foundations of who he is. He's like, no, I'm called to do this. Right? That's an admonition for us today, too. Like We have a calling that God's placed on our life. And it's our job to walk that out and fulfill that. And no matter where we end up, we know that it's still part of the grace of God if we're you know, living by his word and listening to him. And that's the, that's the next steps. Like, I know after we finish 2 Timothy, I'm done, but there's going to be a whole lot of teaching and stuff coming out about. Now, if you have a foundation of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you really love him and seek him and you're obeying his word, that's when things really start going. You know, that's when your faith just starts increasing. Right? When you put yourself on the back burner, you start listening to the Holy Spirit and you say, you know what, God, I'm, I'm tired of doing this my way. Let's try it your way. What do you want to do, Lord? I tell you, like, when I stopped trying to wrestle with who God wanted me to be, and I was like, all right, God, what do you want? Like, I'll just start listening to you, <laughs> right? Rather than figure it out, like, I'm doing all this deep thinking. I'm just this brilliant guy. I'm going to figure out God's, well, I could just ask him and listen, you know. Maybe put down all my own wrestling and obey. And it's amazing what God does. So, again, I'm sorry. I'm not just trying to talk about myself, but <laughs> if, if God can use me, he can use anybody. And I, I'm an easy example to use. So, remember, he's talking about this calling that God put on his life. Oh, verse 10, he says, But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Remember Paul's reading this? He's writing this in prison as he's about to die, and he's talking about, oh, man, how glorious this life's going to be. God has given us immortality, and he's abolished death. You know, it's like at the test of it, he's really, he's doubling down in faith. You know, now he's not doubting. I don't have a ton of time to go in this, but even remember John the Baptist at the end of his life. He was the one. John the Baptist was out in the wilderness. Jesus, when nobody knew him, was walking up, and he's like, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When you find John at the end of his journey, right, all of a sudden he's in prison, and he has to get one of his buddies, and he says, Hey, go out and ask Jesus if he's the Messiah or if someone else is coming. You know, not knocking John the Baptist. But, you know, even he at the end of his life had a doubt. <laughs> he had the end of his life, he's doubting. He's like, hey, Jesus, are you the guy? Because, you know, he wasn't doubting Jesus, but John the Baptist was like, I didn't think things would end up this way. <laughs> you know, but I love Paul. He has no, he doesn't care about how things are going. He's like, I know what I know. I know who Jesus is, and I know who I am in him. So that's the facts. Uh, he continues in verse 11. He says, whereunto I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. He says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And this is the key line, if you're paying attention. He says, And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What I love about this is, we have all the background and context, right? Throughout all of Titus and Timothy, 1 Timothy, 
Remember, Paul is telling them, like, God's given you this. God's entrusted you with the gospel. He's given you this duty, and he's committed this grace into your life. And then at the end of his life, he's saying, guess what? And I know that everything that I have entrusted to God, he's going to hold it, and he's going to be faithful with it. And I love it's not just like, well, I'm hoping. He says, no, I'm persuaded. Like, me and Jesus have some backstory. We've been through some things together. Through thick and thin, he's been with me. He says, I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed to him unto that day. So then he encourages them in verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which you have heard of me in faith and love which is in Jesus Christ. So he's saying, you know, hold tight to the scriptures. right? Don't forget that's our foundation. This is something in the church we call verbal plenary inspiration, which is a fancy way of saying like God wrote what he wrote and he meant what he said. Like it's not an allegory. It's not just fun stories. <laughs> you know, that's really popular nowadays. Like, oh, yeah, the Bible? Oh, great book. Good stories. You know, nah, don't, you know, it's, don't take it too seriously. You know, it's not all literal. You know, like a lot of people will do that kind of dance around it because they don't want to stand by what the Word of God says and say, hey, God said what he said and he meant what he meant. So, but Paul is encouraging him, like, hold fast to the Word. Not just like everything I say, but hold fast to what God says. Verse 14, it says, the good... Th- That good thing which was committed unto you, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in you. So again, that's that's where the rubber meets the road. The Holy Ghost in us keeps that stuff. That's the only way we can live out our life. Verse 15, he says, This you know, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. And he mentions two people, of whom Phygelus and Hermogenes Oh, I missed something there. By, yeah, by Philogus and Hermonides. <laughs> He's like, remember all those churches I marched around? Yeah, they've all left me. <laughs> He's not worried about it. So he continues on. Uh, well, a little background. Asia Minor, we talked about that. That's where Turkey is now. All these churches that were ruled by the Romans. He was actually you know, kicked out. And he wasn't supposed to minister anymore. But he still kept evangelizing all over the place even though other people had left the faith and had left him. Verse 16, it says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he has oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Again, sometimes it's not the many, it's the one person who's still faithful with you. Imagine the reward this guy will get, right? Like a lot of people love Paul when he's popular. Everyone's, oh yeah, Paul, I love Paul, right? We all love Paul, he's great. But then when everyone hates him, he's like, Paul's my guy. (laughs) And it says he often refreshed him and took care of him. It's like, man, what a reward in heaven he's going to get. Because when it's hard to be somebody's friend, that's when you most need a friend. And that's that's who he was. I hope we all have some Onesiphoruses in our life. Verse 17, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus. You know very well. So, I said all that to say, you know, that's exactly the attitude we ought to have. It's kind of, you know, people like, not deathbed kind of stuff, but when you get to the end of your life and people have wisdom, you know, that's kind of when like the real truths come out, that's when the fluffs disappeared. (laughs) Right, all the flowery language goes away, and it's the real talk. And I love this letter. Paul, Paul focuses. It's the same stuff he was saying, but it's to the heart of the matter. You know, that as you're doing what God's called you to do, you can't have a spirit of fear, especially in this time. Now is when it's easiest to be fearful, and that now is when God needs us most to step up and be confident in who he is. You know, like... Um, with everything going on with the virus and the pandemic and stuff, I know very people I really love and care about right now are in the hospital fighting for their life. Like, I'm not saying, oh, it's not real. You don't got to believe in it. You know, I'm not saying any of that stuff. Like, it's, it's real. And it's not good. But guess what? We can't be afraid of it. Right now, politically, there's all kinds of, like, even say the word politics, and everyone's like, what's, what's he going to say? <laughs> Cut the cameras quick. You know, like, as soon as you talk about that stuff, right, there's so much pressure. Like, you can't talk about a whole list of stuff now because everyone's all worried and you could offend somebody and get sued and people be all mad. And it's like, that's just the devil trying to say, hey, 
you can't speak up for what you believe in. And I'm not just talking about politics stuff, like, but you can't stand up and tell somebody if they're trying to do something, you go, no, that's not right. You can't do that. You know? Right. Oh, you can't speak your mind. You can't stand on the word of God. You can't stand up for what's right. The devil is trying to put a sock in everyone's mouth. Why? Because now is when God needs us most to stand up and speak the truth and live as people of integrity. Amen. And again, I'm not, that goes even beyond just standing for biblical truth. It's what's standing for right in our workplaces and in our homes and amongst our friends. There are things that, guess what, now's the time of compromise. Everyone's like, oh, come on, you can, you can just do this and like, just have whatever. Right? It's easy to compromise with somebody, but a compromise, who knows what a compromise is, right? It's a lose-lose. Right? Like neither party gets what they want. So of course the devil's going to say, why don't you just compromise? Why don't you just have a little bit of this? Well, that's a lose-lose. Guess what? You have to stand on the word of God and not give up an inch. Right? Now's the time. Okay. I, when we started, the pandemic started. Like I remember Pastor Jay and I standing out in the foyer playing our guitars together. That's why I kind of wanted to be like this tonight. Just kind of takes me back. And I just remember that like, this is the greatest opportunity of our lives, right? Paul had the greatest opportunity to be a minister of the gospel and to preach Jesus Christ because it was so awful. The Roman Empire was there, right? They're persecuting everybody. I mean, he, he himself got thrown in and out of prison a bunch of times. Perfect. That's the perfect opportunity to, to be a witness of the gospel. Same thing for us right now. You might, oh, now's the worst time ever. It's like, all right, if you're willing to do what God says and lean in, now's the perfect opportunity for God to use you. To, I mean, like, how many years ago? We didn't even do live streams. Yeah, it took some tough times, but guess what? We, we rose above that. We overcame that. Now it's an opportunity that I can't believe how many people, since we started streaming online, coming back in person, all these people who come in for a visit and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I found you guys because you watched you online. I've watched a bunch of stuff, so happy to be here. It's like, praise God. Like he takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for good. So right now you might be saying, oh, I'm going through some evil, but I know God's going to use it for good. And I'm not just saying this because my life's peachy keen. Like there's stuff going on I could be complaining about and be upset about. And I'm just like, okay, well, it is what it is, but I know God's going to use this. Amen. So again, Paul's admonition, the key verse, God has not given us a spirit of fear. So we love that part. But then what comes in the next part is almost, I don't want to say scary because we shouldn't have a, it's not scary. But that's when the responsibility comes. All right, if God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, yeah, amen, I love it, we don't have fear. Now we have a responsibility because he's given us a spirit of power. He's given us a spirit of love and he's given us a sound mind. There's some expectations that come with that. And guess what, you only get that when you're mature, right? When, you're, when you've matured, that's when you get the extra responsibility. So as we've gone through this, I thank you for your faithfulness to, to go verse by verse through all this, but I know God's going to use this church and the church in this city to do amazing things. Amen. And some of it's going to be different buildings, but again, what, what's so cool is God's doing stuff in this church, and it's not just the building, it's the people. Yeah. So I love seeing just people that I've known for a few years it's like, man, you now versus a you year ago is a different person, right? <laughs> There's people sitting in this room that it's like, man, you a year ago, wow, versus you now, you are 20 times more confident. You know, you used to be like all thinking about yourself and worried about yourself all the time, and now you're like out there shaking hands with people. <laughs> You know, I won't say people's names, but there's a person I know we know. It's like, man, a year ago wouldn't say anything to anybody. Now he's a greeting and seating people, shaking hands. And it's like, man, when God gets a hold of some people, it's cool to see how much you can grow. And if you're willing to lean into the process and grow, now's the time when God just shoots people up. Right? There's an expedite. Right? There's a quickening that comes. That, guess what? We don't have a ton of time. I, I know a person who ministered to me when I was brand new in the faith, they said, guess what? What took me 20 years to learn, you're going to learn in a year. You know why? So there's not enough time. <laughs> so God's pouring in his people. He's pouring out his spirit to people who are ready, willing, and able. So they'll grow. And he's like, guess what? What took you a year to learn, you're going to pass on to people, and they're going to pick up in 20 minutes. Why? Because that's what God wants to do. He's, he's pouring out his spirit. He's moving amongst his people. And like I said, we just have to be 
ready for it. We just have to be willing to do what he says. So I'm rambling right now. I'll pray. God, we thank you for your spirit tonight. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you for these words. God, that we can take comfort. And yes, knowing that you've given us the gospel, you've entrusted us. But God, we praise you that we have full confidence and that we are persuaded that everything we put in your hands, that when we commit our lives to live according to your word, God, when we commit to be disciples, God, everything that we had to give up and pour out and just trust you with, God, we thank you that you are faithful to watch over it. God, we thank you that you will finish and be you know, committed and faithful to your word and everything that you've done with us, God. Just like Paul said, I'm persuaded, God. I just believe you. Lord, even though times are tough, we thank you that we get to live in these times. Just like Mordecai told Esther, he said, who knows, but you were born for such a time as this. God, we thank you that you've entrusted us to live in these turbulent times because people need you more than anything. In the, in the shaking and in the turbulence and all the craziness, your word stands as a foundation, God, that we can stand on, that we can rely on. When everything else is shaking, we know that you are a firm foundation. God, give us that just remove every bit of fear, just like we sang in all those songs. And God, help us to realize what we have access to because you have given us your Holy Spirit, that we have this power, that we have the love of God in our lives, that when people get mad and abandon us and say things and talk bad about us, that guess what? We just still love them because we have the love of God in us. And God, we thank you that you have given us a sound mind. That what might cause others to go crazy, Lord, we know that you are working all things out for our good. So God, tonight we just stand on your word. We praise you, just like Paul's in prison. He says, I thank God for all this. God, we thank you for this opportunity. Help us to be pliable in your hands. Help us to just to take time to listen to you, to hear your spirit, and to obey your word. God, I'm just so looking forward to everything that you're going to do. We praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, so have a good night. God bless.